across it once a month. It's hey. Good afternoon. We will call to order the October 2018 City of Columbia Planning Commission meeting. Welcome to all. We'd like to welcome Planning Commission members, staff, and guests. I would like to ask everyone now to turn their cell phones and PDAs to the silent or vibrate mode. The administrator will now proceed with the roll call. Mr. Tupper? Here. Uh, Ms. Mandel? Mr. Frost? Here. Ms. Hartz? Here. Mr. Cohn? Here. Mr. Stigemeyer? Here. Ms. James? Here. Um, Mr. Waits? Here. And Mr. Dolphin? Here. We have quorum. Thank you. I will now briefly review the meeting format. Applicants with requests before the Planning Commission are allotted a presentation time of 10 minutes. This time should include, but is not limited to, an overview of the project, case history, and any pertinent meetings held regarding the request. This time also includes all persons presenting information on behalf of the applicants, such as attorneys, engineers, and architects. This time limit does not include any questions asked by Planning Commission or staff regarding requests. Members of the general public are given the opportunity to address their concerns in intervals of two minutes. The administrator has a timer and will make presenters aware when their time has expired. The Planning Commission reserves the right to amend these procedures on a case-by-case -case basis. The Consent Agenda. The Planning Commission uses the Consent Agenda to approve non-controversial or routine matters by a single motion and vote. Examples of such items include approval of site plans, annexations, and street names. If a member of the Planning Commission or the general public would like to discuss an item on the consent agenda, that item is removed from the consent agenda and considered during the meeting. The Planning Commission then approves the remaining consent agenda items. The administrator will now read the consent agenda. The consent agenda this evening consists of two items. The first item is the approval of the September 5, 2018 minutes. And the second item is a site plan review for 2300 Elmwood Avenue, uh, which is a request for a site plan review uh, for a three-story, 58-unit multifamily building. Do any commission members or guests today wish to have any items on the consent agenda removed and placed on the regular agenda? I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <laughs> consent agenda is approved. We will now proceed with the regular agenda. And I would also like today to remind everyone when they come forward to please state their name clearly before speaking. Your third item for this evening is 16 Pendleton Street. It is a uh, minor amendment to a plan unit development. Uh, it is located in a PUDC and a, uh, it also is in the uh, design development uh, review area as well as um, designated as DP in the uh, design and preservation area. Are there any questions for staff from the commission? Is there anyone, any guests that would like to speak? 
Matt, I'll ask for a motion, please. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minor amendment to the PUD at uh, 1619 Pendleton Street. We have a second. 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 Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <laughs> Motions are pa passed. Your 30, third item this evening is a major amendment to a planned unit development. This is for 3319 Millwood Avenue. Um, it is an amendment for the planned unit development of uh, Commercial District PUDC. And the applicant is here. Okay. Um, before we begin, I'm sorry, can I ask? The applicant is here. Okay. Uh, before we have the applicant, are there any questions for staff at this point in time? Okay. If the applicant would like to come forward. Good evening. My name is Raymond Perkins. I'm Director of Facilities for Richland One. And uh, tonight we want to bring before you uh, the proposed amendments to the PUD that is located at uh, Drea High School. Uh, we're certainly appreciative of the opportunity to bring it to you. Uh, we have worked very hard with the uh, city staff, uh, city council, uh, and we do have an agreement uh, that uh, we bring forward uh, outlining how this particular development will be uh, developed. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask that the um, architect for the uh, project comes up and give you details of uh, that agreement and outline how we intend to proceed. Thank you. Uh, do we have a site plan that we can share with everybody? So my name is, uh, while that's coming up, uh, my name is Doug Quackenbush, Quackenbush Architects and Planners. We've been involved in this project for a couple of years now, uh, working through the details, um, as many of you are aware. I thought the easiest way, this is the drawing I was looking for, the easiest way to kind of give you a quick overview is to go in the order of the mediation agreement, which summarizes the discussions that we had during that mediation that Mr. Perkins was referring to. So uh, the first significant shift in this new plan from previous studies is shifting the tennis courts to the southeast corner of the site. By shifting those tennis courts, that allowed us to shift the position of the practice field, which is the linchpin to making the whole plan work. Uh, so you can see those tennis courts, five of them, again, in that southeast quadrant. That also puts them on a, the most public portion of the property. That allowed the multi-purpose field to be shifted uh, further away from Adger Road and from Michigan in its current position. What ties it to its uh, north-south axis is we are required to have emergency vehicle access that goes around the school, and that set the datum line for how it's positioned uh, north and south. Uh, east and west, we pushed it as far west as we could, but uh, the, the third tenet of the plan is the reconfiguration of the bus loop on site, which you can see there is kind of the vertical oval. Uh, we had to work with several um, governing agencies that dictate the requirements of bus loops, including uh, the Office of School Facilities for the State, DOT, etc. So we uh, jumped on this new uh, idea and tightened it as much as we could so that we could accommodate that shift to the west. Um, we also uh, reconfigured the existing parking lot that is located there to the west of the campus, uh, removed some islands that used to contain trees. Those trees have gone away in the 12 or 13 years since the school was built uh, to increase parking, given that we took away parking, the teacher parking lot, that is where the proposed field will be located. We have created what we're calling an arboretum. Uh, which is on the northern portion of the site. What you see on your drawing has actually been amended. That fence line has shifted due to the neighborhood's request. It's now going from corner to corner, so it just increases that, that arboretum 
section a little bit more from what you see on that plan. Nonetheless, the concept is that's fenced off. It gets additional landscape screening um, and is uh, es essentially mostly inactive and controlled. Um, lots of uh, conversations about uh, the mechanism to accomplish this. Originally, we were looking to get rid of the PUD uh, because we thought that was the only avenue available to us. Another breakthrough in the mediation is to establish a mixed-use PUD, which allows the HUD requirements to remain in effect and be amended per this document. So you'll see to the extreme west uh, a grassed area that is designated for residential. Uh, there is no current plans to build anything on that. That is simply allowing us to maintain a mixed-use PUD instead of a single-use PUD. Lots of uh, requirements in the document about further changes would be vetted uh, in a systematic process, the language I think you see in front of you. Lots of conversation about lighting. Uh, so the lighting has been vetted. Uh, the district has committed to spending um, additional monies to ensure that we have LED lighting for both the tennis courts and the multipurpose field. That allows us to control light pollution much more exactly and keep the light on the field not leaking off the site. Also requirements about no sound systems, limitation of bleacher heights, and other details, which I won't get into, but can answer those questions if you have them. So I think those are the major uh, concepts uh, that are captured in the plan. And if you have any questions, be happy to accept those. In the first um, <clears throat> proposal, were there lights on the field and on the uh, tennis courts? Yes. Were there st stands for the? Uh... Yes. People to come. The, the difference between the initial proposal and this one is more specificity on how we're doing the lighting and uh, more limitations on the scale of the bleachers. What about the parking? Because it says there's, if I'm reading it correctly, there's 381 spaces. But if you fill up this field, I thought this was going to be a practice field. That's exactly what it is. It's a practice field with turf. Uh, the, the revised parking count is 381. That's down from about 413 previously. So the teacher parking lot that currently exists to the north of the school, where the practice field is shown, goes away. And we were able to pick up some of those parking spaces by reconfiguring the student lot, removing islands, making it a little bit more efficient. And of course, you see a finger of new parking that extends to the residential lots on the west. So if it's a practice field, why do you need a scoreboard? I'm, there, I'm there thinking will be, down the road what this could become. OK. And, and a lot of that is covered in the mediation agreement in terms of uses. Uh, the intent is that there would be JV games occasionally hosted at this site, um, which is the reason for the bleachers and the reason for the scoreboard. But there is no longer a press box. There's no longer a sound system. It's very limited use and limited in terms of time of day as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I, I have a question. You've referenced the mediation agreement a few times. I don't know if you're the best person to address that or if Mr. Perkins is the best person to address that. But that's a different wrinkle than the last three times that this came forward is there's been a mediation. I'd like to hear a little bit about that and who stakeholders were at the table on that. Yes, sir. Um, as a result of the presentation that we made to city council uh, at the last time, it, uh, it was a result of that that the mayor uh, directed uh, us to, to go into that mediation. I can't remember the name of the mediator, but the people involved was obviously uh, Councilman Rickman, uh, the mayor, uh, members of the board, I think uh, Ms. Harris, the chairwoman, and uh, Mr. Uh, Devine, and then there were several members from the community that was a part of that meeting as well. Uh, so that lasted uh, all of about eight or nine hours that day. Okay. There were, is, there were about 40 people that came. There were lots of so is there an agreement that's been signed between the neighborhood, which clearly was the, the strife and where we're at today? There was a signed agreement. Yes. By whom? That'd be great. Thanks, Doug. We'll give it. Thanks. 
So do these parties represent everyone in the neighborhood and at the school? Yes, uh, I believe that was uh, the Thanks, Doug. Heathwood uh, community and also Melrose community as well. And part of the question that I asked is uh, we were passed along as part of our pre-meeting materials a bunch of letters from neighbors to the tune of probably 60 pages in opposition. And I just was trying to get my arms around if that was representing the majority or if that was just folks that may not have participated in that process. I, it was unclear to me by not seeing that agreement until just now. Okay. I, I'm not sure. I have not seen, heard those letters, but uh, certainly. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions right now for the applicant? Okay, I'd like to call. Thank you. Yes. We will get back. I'd like to call uh, any other guests who would like to come forward on the other side. We're going to try to do this. The people in supporting of it, and there are people we've gotten emails and letters from who do not support it. So we want to try to have one go and then the other, other go so we can hear both sides tonight. My name is Jim Gregory. Most of you already know I live at 812 Adger Road. I'm directly across the street from this facility. Let me say very first, I do not condone nor do I accept what is called a memorandum of intent. We were never advised what was in that. The uh, people from the Heathwood Association that signed it, one in particular had absolutely no authority to sign it. He happened to be a neighbor and the co-presidents, we do question whether they should have signed it without giving it to the neighborhood. When this, if this thing happens, when I walk out my front door, I will be looking at the back of a school board, the lights, the goal post, and the net that's gonna go behind it. The glow from the lights, I don't care what kind of lights you put in there, will affect the entire neighborhood. Um, this whole memorandum of agreement and of intent, excuse me, you know, none of the neighbors I have talked to believe in it. None of them accept it. It certainly wasn't any of the wishes that I had. The um, application is so full of holes that you could probably use it as a sieve. There's so many loopholes in there that they can come back and say, instead of this, we really want to do this and still be within the guidelines. The... Um, other thing is, I have been in my house since 1986. Yes, I was there in 2003 when all this started. And the whole agreement between the, a whole deal between the neighbors and the Richland County, Richland School Board one and the district, and the Dreer, excuse me, was that there would be a buffer. Everything would be shifted to Millwood and there would always be a buffer between the school and the neighborhoods. They even made the statement at the time that they could not put anything in there because they didn't have the land to do it. Drea is sitting on less than 21 acres. Its current guidelines for an elementary school is 25, for a middle school is 50, and for a high school is 75. They've got one-third less land than they really need. The yeah, this thing's gone on for two years. But one thing, we are more resolved to do, make sure it does not happen now. I would urge you to deny this application for the fourth time because in 2003, we made a deal, and a deal is a deal. Thank you. Thank you. Someone supporting this if they'd like to. Chairman and members of the commission, I'm Toby Ward. 
uh, I represented the two neighborhood associations who were uh, a party to the mediation and the mediated agreement. Uh, first of all, if it's not already incorporated, I would ask that the mediated agreement be made a part of the record of the uh, application. Um, and it, I don't believe there's any reason that we shouldn't do that. Um, second of all, we, that is uh, myself and the officers of both associations, have compared the mediated agreement to the PUD application, and we do not find any glaring uh, inconsistencies. Uh, we do reserve the right to continue to work with the district to address some things, uh, particularly uh, landscaping. We think <clears throat> that we can do some fine tuning there, um, as well as mechanisms for the dissemination of information by the school district, not only to the uh, neighborhood associations, but to the property owners who are immediately adjacent and contiguous to the school property. Uh, and so uh, finally, what I want to say is this. The neighborhood associations do not intend to bind or limit the rights of any individual property owners. Uh, that was not the role of the neighborhood associations, rather, our role was to address the issue with which we were confronted in its totality, the effect on the total neighborhood and where this process would end up were the uh, major amendments not to be uh, moved through and the PUD were to collapse. That would present a clear and present danger to the neighborhood and that's what uh, this mediate, that's what motivated this mediated agreement, as well as the ability to count votes at council. And so, uh, again, I urge you to listen to the residents who are affected, uh, and I urge you to consider that the neighborhood associations will abide by the mediated agreement. Be glad to answer any questions. I'd like to ask a question, Mr. Yes. Ward. As counsel for the neighborhood associations that you just referenced, there was a comment that was made previous to your remarks that the signatures were not uh, of authority, they were not the proper people to sign this agreement. Can you comment on that in any respect? It was my belief at the time that the neighborhood associations were properly authorized to participate in the mediation and that they were properly authorized to sign the mediated agreement. Uh, were it otherwise, we would not have gone to the mediated agreement. And that, and that issue came up prior to the mediated agreement, and it was discussed. And so I believe that there was uh, proper authority for both neighborhood associations to sign that agreement, understanding, again, it doesn't affect the rights of any individual property owner. Thanks, Toby. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, you referenced a clear and present danger to the neighborhood if this PUD mediation collapses. What, what do you Well, it goes something like this. The PUD currently, without the major amendment, is flawed because it does not have a mixed use. If the PUD were to be determined to be invalid, then the property would, reserve, would revert to its original zoning, which would mean that any changes to the property would be approved by the Board of Zoning Appeals, and that would not take it through council. So that was a problem. Second of all, the citywide rezoning that's imminent would treat this as a type of property and thus use that would enable the district to have greater rights, we believe, with respect to the use of the property than are currently uh, available to them under the PUD. And so if this PUD goes away, uh, the neighborhood associations believe that they were exposed to substantial risk, whether it was reverting to the original zoning or with the, what this would likely be rezoned under the new rezoning that's going to happen eventually. 
I have a question for staff. He brings up an interesting point. Should this not be approved today and it remains the existing PUDC that's in place, what is it designated to in the new zoning and does that change by us considering this re rezoning? So um, to answer the first part of your question, your, your vote today is a recommendation to city council. Understood. So it's city council who actually makes a decision to, Understood. to approve or deny this particular request. Uh, the second half of your question, uh, with regard to the new zoning, um, as we've mentioned in a lot of the public meetings and workshops with the Planning Commission, the process is first to create the text and the districts, and the second process will be to actually map it. So at this time, we have a draft um, of all of the districts, but we don't have a particular map. So staff can't answer the question of what this zoning would or would not be. So there's, he's making an assumption then based on that comment. Yeah, that's his interpretation of how a map could be made. Fair enough. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Would someone, um, would any of our guests like to come up and speak in favor of the neighborhood? Thank you. My name is Robert Crooks. I live on Casina. I've been here before because my wife was involved in the 2003 agreement. First of all, let me say that the mediation, so-called mediation agreement, Sam and Mary Waters are co-presidents. Don Tudor is just a neighbor. Fred Easley is uh, Melrose Heights. They're like four individuals have no legal representation of the neighborhood. I never saw any of this. It's never been discussed with me, and they know full well that I've been against it since day one. So prior to the so-called mediation, Mr. Sam Waters told me, I can't make any decisions without discussing it with the neighborhood. So if I go to a mediation, I have to come out, and talk with the neighborhood. He was not allowed that opportunity. So as far as I'm concerned, the mediation is a farce. Well, in 2003, the agreement was uh, reached after a lengthy and arduous discussion. My wife was involved, so was Mr. Perkins, other school representatives. Chip Land was here at the time. Without this agreement, this building, Dreer High School, would not be sitting where it is, and it would not have been built. Also in the agreement, there was the buffer green space that was des designated to protect the neighborhood. And I quote from the agreement. Possible use of undeveloped green space. Areas undesignated in the site plan shall remain as grassed areas. Physical changes to these areas, such as paving for parking or additional sports surfacing, is not anticipated. We went on that promise. How can anyone honestly and ethically permit destruction of the green space buffer by ignoring this 2001 agreement? Let me ask you yes. a couple questions. <clears throat> it did not clearly state it could not be done. It just said it's not anticipated, right? Right. Okay. You know, that was a problem that you know, my wife was there. She said, you had I known that this would come up 15 years later. And I'll also mention, for 15 years, we've had a fairly peaceful coexistence with Jura High School. If they build this, that's going to be destroyed. We'll go back to the way that it was when there was a ball field there. Were you invited to the mediation? No. I was given no opportunity and has not, have not had any discussions with any of the people that were there. And I, I think I've been intentionally excluded because they know that I have strong feelings against it. Thank you. Thank you. What, any? Uh, very briefly, Mr. Chairman, my name is Michael Burkett. I'm here, I'm here on behalf of the uh, Dreer Parents, specifically the Booster Club. We just wanted to note that we did participate in the mediation. It was nine hours, um, but very productive, um, and that we uh, are in support of the design and the application and the rules that were set forth in the mediation. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is John Bruton. I live at 3211 Michigan Street. Uh, with, with respect to the mediated document or memorandum of understanding, uh, I'm not aware of a single 
resident of Michigan Street that was invited to participate in the mediation or has approved that document or otherwise is in favor of this plan. Um, as you may know, Michigan Street is comprised of small, affordable homes for young families. Our respective front yards are about 50 feet away from Dreer's campus. Um, and I think the, 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 sit, the residents of Michigan Street are, are continue to be very concerned about the specter of living next to a sports stadium. When I bought my house in 2016, I did it with the intent to live on Michigan Street for the indefinite future. However, had I known that, I, that this proposal was in the works, I never would have bought in that house. And I think this planning commission properly analyzed the land use issues the last three times something similar came, came up and, and you rejected it. And I would respectfully request that you do the same tonight. And for the record, both my mom and my sister played varsity sports at Dreer High School, and my family has been a supporter of Dreer Athletics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any other guests who would like to come forward and speak tonight? Good evening. I'm Foster Hazelden. Um, I've spoken three previous times. I live at 827 Adger Road with my um, wife and my two young sons, my three-year-old and my two-year-old. I've spoken previously about my history, my family history with Dreer. It's pretty extensive. I, of course, played soccer and golf. My brother played um, football. My sister played tennis, and we all went to Dreer in Lua AC4 because I lived in the walk zone. You probably remember those comments. I won't belabor that point because um, I am fond of Dreer. But I just want to point out and reiterate what Mr. Gregory said. Uh, the, my understanding from what's been reported in the state newspaper is that the ideal geographic footprint for an elementary school is 20 to 30 acres, a middle school is 50, and a high school is 100. So when you take out this very charged, emotionally charged debate that's very political, as we all know, um, and you look at it, does it make sense to put a stadium next to a small elementary school? There's 20.96 acres. And just think about that because I do question that, and um, you just, it's, just, it's jammed in there. The buffer was there. Where's the buffer now? I've asked for two years for measurements, never received them. I don't think that's a tall ask. It does make me question um, what will happen down the road. I'll, as an attorney, I'm a federal litigator. Mediations are bound by the court rules or if considerations exchange. That didn't happen here. And so you look at that, it's only, the only binding impact of that is your word. And a deal is a deal, as Mr. Gregory had said, but it's not bound by the court rules and no consideration was exchanged. So there you go on that. Also, I, I get very upset about the point of, you know, basically what people are saying is just sue. And I had Councilman Howard Duvall in my house a week after y'all voted this down the first time. I said, how do you tell me that my son, who at that time was two, how he's not going to be, his quality of life isn't going to be eviscerated with the light shining in there. And he said to me at Foster, I think about your family more than any other, and I appreciate that. And then he said to me, and I said, so what's my remedy? And he said to get a good lawyer. And is that the city we've become where we just, hey, just sue, just sue, just sue? I just don't think that's good policy. But I am opposed to this. I encourage you to please vote it down again. It's, it's just too small. It's 20.96 acres, no measurements in over two years, a mediation that isn't really totally valid, and then the remedy is just sue the city. Everybody. I mean, that's what we've become, and that's unfortunate. But I appreciate your time and talking to you the other four times as well. Um, if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for staff. John, um, Mr. Ward offered including the arbitration agreement or mediation agreement, excuse me, within the PUD. Is there any reason that it has been excluded to point? Is there any impact of that statement? Or just, I'm curious why we're not, we didn't see it in the uh, advance of today. It was not submitted with the application. Okay, fair enough. But could it become part of a PUD application? You all could make it part of the record. Got so. it. Okay. Thanks. If there's no further, uh, you'd like, okay. Yes, sir. Thank you all, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Craig Witherspoon, Superintendent Richmond One. Um, so, first of all, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for uh, the work that you do and, and the consideration we have been for before you uh, uh, several times. And as has been stated, um, 
we, we did receive direction uh, from the mayor's office to go back to mediate and, and sit down and, and, and to, to hash some of these things out, which we did, and those things are represented in what we, uh, what, what's been presented to you this evening. Also, um, beyond that, uh, Councilman Rickenman has gone back out, according to him, and had subsequent conversation uh, with folks in the neighborhoods um, after this has happened, and that resulted in some of the changes uh, again, that were spoken to uh, this evening. Uh, so as, as, as the district, we try to be, be good stewards, good neighbors, to listen, to work together, uh, to see if we can't find uh, a resolution in this regard. And um, we feel as though we have done that, uh, listened, and, and, and brought the recommendations back and forth, uh, both, both before the mediated agreement and then after that fact. So I just wanted to make that clear. And, um, Again, thank you all for your time this evening. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to come forward? Thank you. My name is Nancy Barksdale. I live two blocks from Dreer, and I oppose this application. Before I get into my few, few remarks, I do want to ask a question relative to something, Mr. Cohn, I believe you asked about, or, or maybe it was you, um, what would this be rezoned under the comprehensive 2018 plan? According to the case summary you ha were provided, it's my understanding that it would be zoned UCR1, and if this proposal was presented under that zoning designation, this application would have to go to BOZO to get approved. Is that correct? That would be a question for me to sure, ask staff. So that's, and that's why I'm trying to clarify that. Sure, so the UCR1 is a land use classification, not a zoning classification. And the land use plan is a guide for how the land use should be um, distributed throughout the city. And you can have multiple types of zoning apply to different land uses. So um, there is no um, regulatory uh, uh, I guess, uh, um, neat, so to speak, or any regulatory perspective from that UCR1. Um, it's just uh, basically a guiding document for the uh, planning commission. Okay. Of the so at this time, we don't know what the zoning designation for this parcel will be? So the city has um, two documents that deal with uh, land use. One is the the comprehensive plan, which has a land use plan in it, that's the UCR1. And then we have the zoning, which is the regulatory tool that uh, tells you what you can do and how big the setbacks and bulk of the building and all those types of things. Um, we are rewriting our zoning code, but uh, we uh, currently have the text drafted. And the process that we're going to follow is we're going to uh, present the uh, text of the document to the community. Uh, council will adopt the text, and then we will go to part two, which will be actually the mapping exercise. Um, so at this time, it's too early to tell anyone what any one particular property in the city would, its future zoning could be. Mm -hmm. um, that would probably come out probably in the next year or so. Okay. The application before you tonight may look different, but it is still the same. The school district is still trying to shoehorn competition, sports, fields, tennis courts on a small piece of property hardly large enough for the elementary school. Plus, they've added the 70-foot light poles and 600 bleacher seats. This amendment application is the school district's attempt to avoid going to Boza. Previously, they've asked for an RS2 rezoning. In that instance, they would have to go to Boza. And Boza has very strict criteria as to what can be approved to go on a, for a special exception. This plan clearly will not pass Boza's criteria. That's why they've resorted to this rearrange the PUD to make the PUD a different PUD. The other comment I would make is as it relates to the mediation. 
at the, um, at the city council meeting in March, when it came for a vote, the mayor said, you must go to mediation on your RS2 application. The neighbors were not invited to that meeting. The meeting was only set up a week before the uh, mediation was to take place. Only the president of Melrose Heights, where I am, went to the meeting. No other neighbors were asked to come and attend. The first, it was a two-day meeting. Friday afternoon, they had the meeting, and the second part of the meeting was on Monday. In between that weekend, I wrote to my president, I wrote to the presidents of the Heathwood Neighborhood Association saying, what is going on? I got no responses from anyone. We were not privy to the idea that all of a sudden an RS2 was going to now become a PUD amendment. We got no feedback. So I, I take issue uh, with the idea that this was something the neighbors bought in on, not at all. Um, I think that this commission has wisely denied the school district's applications three times prior. Nothing has been said tonight that would suggest those denials were wrong. An agreement is an agreement. I respectfully ask that you deny this application for the fourth time. Thank you. Is there... Good afternoon, uh, Chairman and all the members of the Planning Committee. Uh, my name is Cheryl Harris, and I serve as the Chair of Richland County School District 1 Board of Commissioners, and I've been fortunate to serve the entire four years that we've been working on this project across our district. And When we started this project, the purpose and the intent was to secure our practice fields as well as our stadiums and to add one additional stadium because our district is 500 square miles. We were putting a lot of students at risk with them traveling across town. Our tennis team there at Dreer was having to drive 17 miles one way to a game. There were many games they had to forfeit because they had to get off the court so other planned events could use those fields. And we sat down as a board with our superintendent and others and we started working on how we could address the issues that we were facing and the challenges in Richland 1 for all schools. And in that discussion, we decided to redo the Memorial Bowden and Lower Richland Stadium and add a new one at Keenan to serve all of our students because we have students that play sports midweek because we don't have enough stadiums. The plan before you is not a stadium. It is a multi-purpose field. Our stadiums seat five to 6,000 people. They're huge, huge scoreboards and everything else. This field is designed to do two things to take care of our practice for our JV teams versus them driving over to Memorial, and then to also address some of our JV games. And I have a child that plays JV sports. You rarely have about 100 people there, if that much. I was a part of the mediation in representing the school district along with our vice chair, Mr. Devine, and several others that have already spoken before you, Mr. Burkett, and some others that were present. And in that discussion, it was a very healthy conversation between what we assume to be the leaders of the neighborhoods. Because as I stated to them, my desire was to come to an agreement that does two things. Take care of the children of Richland 1 and take care of our neighbors. I live by those rules. I cannot control what may have happened back in 2003 because I wasn't in the seat that I sit now. But I sat in that meeting in good faith as the leader of this district and worked out an agreement with the neighbor's leaders. And in that agreement, I joyfully signed for everything that they asked us to amend. And after we completed that document, Councilman Rickerman came back and he shared with us that they wanted some other adjustments. I've had numerous meetings making those adjustments. The wording, the arboretum, they wanted it 30 feet, whatever. We're going to do that. There's a wall that we're going to increase the height because it was asked. And the goal is one thing, is to take care of the kids and also to take care of the neighbors. And I respect that. 
I respect that. But at the same time, I have the responsibility of making sure that the students have safe passage. We have after school tutoring for our athletes. It's all but impossible for our students to go through their athletic tutoring and get to practice fields versus being able to do what all of the other students in our other six high schools are allowed to do. And that is have school, grab a quick snack after school, go into their tutoring, and then go out to the practice fields. The purpose of this field, this is not a stadium. It's nowhere near a stadium. It barely seats 200 people on one side and I believe 400 on the other at the request of the neighbors that asked us to take the total down. They even asked that we take the bleachers and make them longer so they wouldn't be as high so that you could not see into the neighbor's home, and we did that. They asked us to not have sound, and we did that. They asked us to lower the lights, and we did that. And everything that has been requested of this district, we have done that. And we've done that in good faith because we're trying to take care of two things, our neighbors and our children. So I'm asking you on today, if you would consider this proposal for the sake of the children that we care about so deeply at Dreer and also for our neighbors. And of course, I know everyone is not going to be happy. I understand that. But I want the community to know and I want you all to know as a planning committee, this district has done everything within its power to make adjustments to accommodate the requests that have been made to us. We have not denied those because we do care about our neighbors. So on today, I'm just asking that you support this plan for the sake of the students that we serve there at Drew High School. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward? Uh, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen of the commission, my name is Robert Patterson. I've lived on Devereux Road since 1972. We moved to Devereux Road so that our children could go to Dreyer High School. And both of our children, Rob Jr. and Anne, are product of Richland One system. Anne, Dreyer, Metafield, Atlas Road, Brennan, Dreyer. So please don't perceive me as an enemy of School District 1. I'm a supporter of School District 1. I've volunteered to talk to students and classes at Dreyer High School. I'm a retired professor of history at USC. So I've taken my road show to Dreyer High School on occasion. But I, you've received my letter. My wife and I feel the same as we have every time the school district has brought this, bef this matter before you. I'll just make a few points. One, this is basically, under a new guise, the same proposal that you have voted down three times. It calls itself as a, an amendment, but it is basically restructuring this prob property as it did in previous proposals. Number two, this proposal will have the same negative effect on the, on the neighborhood in terms of sound, light, traffic that the other proposals had. Number three, there is the impression that because the perimeter of this property is planned for shrubbery and 30-foot trees and the like, that somehow the negative effects of the multi-purpose use of this property will be contained in that space. But anybody who knows anything about sound and light, traffic, knows that it's not going to be contained in that space. This greater Heathwood, Melrose, 
And also, please remember the south side and southwest side of Millwood Avenue. Nobody's representing them. Please keep this in mind. This is a special place to live in Columbia. Thank you. Close to business and education. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Anyone else want to come forward? I would like to thank everyone tonight. Oh, is there someone? I'm Martha Fowler. I live in um, Melrose Heights. I wanted to clarify a couple of things that I just felt like y'all maybe are a little unclear about how the mediation happened. Um, there was mediation. There was only one person from Melrose. We have over 500 houses in our neighborhood. There was only one person invited, only one person told where the meeting would be and when it would be. There was also one person at Shand from Shandon. They had a voice and have nothing that touches it. <laughs> um, there were two people from Heathwood that were invited. There was one that just evidently found out and showed up. Um, it probably was wise to not let everybody know when the mediation would happen because things have been so fiery for over two years. It has been an uncomfortable situation. I personally feel like it should never have come up because it was, it was an agreement made when Dreer was built that this would not happen. I am a huge advocate of Dreer. We moved into my grandmother's house so that my children could go to Dreer. Dreer is a wonderful school. Um, at the time my children went, academics were more important than sports, but sports are equally as important to an awful lot of people. I just wanted, I felt like y'all needed some clarification about how the mediation was happened, and there were a lot of people that were not included in it. And that's why you have so many people stepping forward now to say, but I didn't have a voice. You all are our voice. Um, I, I too have questions. There was, there was a meeting that was held at Heathwood the other night at Heathwood Park to talk about this. And someone said, why do we have to have 600 seats? Ms. Harris just said, she goes to JV games all the time and they usually have a hundred people there. Why are we spending that much money to have 600 seats when normally you have a hundred people that come? I think that maybe the neighborhoods might feel more comfortable if we didn't have six to eight hundred seats. Um, I, I don't know how you're going to come to an answer to this. It's, it's a situation that I feel has been very detrimental, detrimental to the community. I, I appreciate what y'all are doing, but I just felt like you needed a little clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman, yes. can we ask if either Sam Waters, Dr. Mary Baskin Waters, Fred Easley, or Donald Tudor are here? Yeah. Do you, may, I, may we ask you? <laughs> Um, how, how was notification sent to, um, and are you, I'm sorry, are you? I'm Fred Eastlake with Melrose Neighborhood. With Melrose. Can you share with us how the uh, notification was provided to the, the rest of the neighbors? And we normally do notifications to the neighborhood through an email system. Now, in regard to the mediation, uh, City Council directed the mediation, and when we went to the mediation, we didn't find out about it until, I, I want to say, it was just a few days prior to the event. And I think that that was, it was the intent was to have the mediation originally with one representative from the neighborhood, uh, from Melrose, one from Heathwood, one or two people from the school district, and one from Shannon. It was supposed to only be four or five people. Councilman Rickenman and the mayor were the ones that were putting this together. We did not find out who was invited to this until basically a day or two before this happened. Um, and the, the reason for it, quite frankly, was that, you know, when you have 20, 30, 40 people, you're never going to reach consensus on anything. 
Our neighborhood originally voted against the plan as it was originally presented three or four iterations ago. Um, I met with my executive committee and we had discussed the best way to move forward based on the information that we had available, which would be one representative. And assuming that, then I was voted as the individual that would go in and represent the neighborhood's interest at that point. I believe the same thing happened with Sam and Mary Waters with their executive committees. Um, I can't speak for them, they're not here, um, but uh, uh, Toby Ward is the attorney that is hired by both Melrose Neighborhood Association and uh, Historic Heathwood to represent us at the mediation and provide assistance. Um, when we met at the mediation, we went through all of these things and we worked all this out in good faith. Um, having said that, there will be people that are not going to be happy with what we came to. It, it, it's just going to be that way. We actually have about 650 residents in uh, Melrose. And it's comprised of three neighborhoods, Melrose Heights, um, Oak Lawn, and um, Fairview. So we're a pretty large conglomeration. We've had meetings over the last two and a half years to address this type of stuff. And we'll send an email out, and the people that show up are the people that show up. Um, you can't push a rope. And so, you know, uh, we've done the best that we can to let people know. We have a Facebook page. Um, we have an email that was sent out. You know, we've done what we can do. So an email was sent out before the meeting inviting some people to the meeting, or you, you said the executive? Not to the mediation. The, executive. Uh, the mediation okay. was directed to us by city council, um, by the mayor and by Councilman Rickman. Did they limit how many people were to come? Yes. How many, people were, how many people were there total? Maybe, what, 17, 15? Uh, well, we've got a list. Uh, it wasn't very many. But yeah, yeah the, um, Mr. Taylor was there. John Taylor was there. Uh, Doug Quackenbush, Krista Hampton was there as well, um, Missy Gentry, and uh, the mediator was Judge Thomas Cooper uh, from down in Charleston, I believe, or he's retired. But uh, that list was put together by the mayor and Councilman Rickman, and they did that specifically to, we only had a limited amount of time to try and get something done. And the more people you add to something, the harder it gets to get anything completed. And so, honestly, I'm pretty sure most of us had no clue who was going to be there until the last minute when we got the invite. Okay, thank you. Sure. I've got a question, actually. Uh, this, is for, this is for the association. Sure. Is your position a voted in position, or how are you guys um, organized? Yes, um, it's voted in. We are a, a corporation. And it's, well, that actually it's the, the Melrose Neighborhood Association. We're recognized by the Secretary of State's office. Um, I'm voted in, I got voted in again back in what year, 2017. And I'll be off in 2019. I kind of regret that I didn't, uh, that I was here again <laughs> for this one. Um, but uh, again, it, it, you know, it's just part of the job. But uh, to answer your question, yes, we're, we're formally recognized by the city um, under um, however the city does that, the, you know, Council of Neighborhoods, and then the, the Secretary of State's office and all that stuff. Thank you. Sure. And in answer to Mr. Waite's question, uh, first of all, Mr. Ms. Waters could not be here. Uh, Mr. Waters is on the board of the American Mortgage Bankers Association or some trade organization which is having its annual convention in Asheville. So that's where they are today. They regret very much not being here. They are officially the Historic Heathwood Neighborhood Association, and that association obtained an, a historic overlay designation for the Heathwood area. Um, they uh, solicited some folks to attend the mediation with them, but as Mr. Easley said, we were instructed not to bring a large crowd. Um, th there was one person other than Mr. and Ms. Waters who attended, that was Donald Tudor. He is not here today, uh, but he is a resident of the Heathwood area, lives right next door to Mr. Hazleton on Adger. Um, and uh, they did the best they could at the mediation, signed the agreement. Uh, afterwards, they released the results of the uh, 
mediation to the neighborhood through their normal means of disseminating that information. I think they've had uh, uh, two neighborhood meetings since that time where this uh, was this agreement was addressed and Mr. Rickerman was in attendance as well as uh, another council member. Um, and they've also had uh, board meetings both before and after this uh, mediation to address this situation. So that's the basis of the corporate authority as best I can relate to you, Sam and Mary Waters not being here. So they actually had the authority to sign for the historic Heathwood. That's Mill. apparently disputed, but uh, I've reviewed the corporate documents, and that's what we concluded. But they don't speak for any individual property owner. They simply speak for the neighborhood association. Uh, and as you can tell, there are property owners who are uh, – very much opposed to this, and that's not unusual in neighborhood associations. I, I do have one question, Mr. Ward. Um, so there were two meetings after this was executed amongst the, the neighborhoods. What was the, who, who organized those meetings? And where is it? The, uh, the uh, Historic Heathwood and Melrose Neighborhood Associations. And, the, and this was presented at those, at those meetings? Both of them, I believe, were held at And the, the mediator was actually Judge Tommy Cooper from uh, Manning, I believe, uh, not from Charleston, but he is a retired circuit judge. And it did take all day. Thank you. I'd like to reiterate again, the mediation was a two-day process. Friday afternoon, and then again on Monday. Over that weekend, none of the attendees at the mediation provided any information to the neighbors to say, this is what we're about to agree to. There was no discussion, because I can assure you, the neighbors never would have signed that agreement. In fact, most neighbors, after they saw that, hammered home, why did y'all not get up and walk out of that meeting? This is not what the neighborhoods wanted. We never got an answer other than they felt intimidated. So I just want you to understand, the, the attendees did not confide in the neighbors, this was just given to us. Did you elect these attendees? No, I did not. And what I do know is the mayor's office sent out an invitation which indicated everyone who was being invited to the meeting. And it included the Melrose president, it included the uh, self-appointed presidents of Heathwood, and it included the Heathwood neighbor who attended. And those are the four that we knew who attended. It, it defies logic to me. Again, that's why I'm asking y'all to please deny this application. Thank you. Just make one point clear. The mediation was held on Thursday, April the 12th. It's one day we started early that morning, and at the end of the day, the document was signed at that point. If there was any other meetings after it, I'm not aware of uh, anything else before that was signed, but it was signed that day. Thank you. It was, it was Friday. The party signed the mediation agreement after the nine hours. The Heathwood Executive, I don't think Toby referenced this, the Heathwood Executive Board approved the mediation agreement 
Friday night, and it was all consummated and dispersed to the parties on Monday. So we only met one day, but it turned into getting the final agreement to the parties on Monday after the Heathwood Executive Board approved it Friday night. Well, we're not a court of law, <laughs> but we're just trying to get all the facts so we can make a fair decision for everyone. And while I'm saying that, I would like to say that all of you have delivered your comments very professionally, and we appreciate that as a commission. If there are at this time no other uh, guests who wish to come forward, I'd like to ask for a motion. Before we get to that, I want to ask um, John a question. You made a comment to me before that we're a recommending body to council. Is that true in an amendment to a PUD as well as it is with a zoning reclassification? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's it's very clear in the in the ordinance that I just wanted everybody to hear that that we're not a jurist. Okay. I'll ask for a motion, please. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve the major amendments to the planning units for all ten four point zero four five dot two at thirty thirty three nineteen Millwood Avenue, and also make the sign radiation agreement a part of the application. Do I have a second? Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. Aye. no. Let's go with a hand vote, please. We have the eyes. The eyes first. Motion is approved. Doug, 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 Doug. Thanks, sir. We told you we'd give it back to you. <laughs> you almost left without it. We'll continue with our meeting. The only other item on your agenda this evening is other business. I just want to remind you that you have a work session later this week. Um, uh, it is at noon to probably 1, 1.30. Um, and then we also have two um, public meetings that we hope to see each of you at one of them. Um, they are Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, the Wednesday meeting for the comprehensive plan is at the Richland Library in the auditorium on the first floor from uh, 5 o'clock to 8, and the Thursday meeting is at Eau Claire Print Building, also from 5 to um, 8, so we hope to see you then. Can I ask you a question about that, John? Sure. Are these formal meetings that begin at 5, or are they a drop-in type of situation? They're a drop-in situation, so the format of the meeting, essentially, um, there'll be different stations throughout the entire um, uh, room. Uh, we'll actually have a couple terminals so that you can do the online survey if you don't want to do it from home. Uh, there's actually a video, like a 101, on what is comprehensive planning. Um, there's lots and lots of different information. Every station has an interactive activity for the public to engage in and provide comments. Um, so you can come for 10 minutes or you can come for an hour. At any time, in the five day window. Yep, Excellent. Correct. Just need to understand that. When is the work session this week? It is, I believe, uh, Thursday. Thursday uh, at noon. And we will have sandwiches for you. <laughs> is, there, is there one there November 4th also? Uh, and then, uh, so that's for the comprehensive plan. And then in November, uh, we are going to have um, a couple different work sessions because uh, at the end of October, we're going get, to be getting the uh, draft of the zoning code back. And so we're going to have a number of workshops for you to uh, review that document since it is a larger document. Um, so we're going to be meeting uh, before the regular Planning Commission meeting, uh, then we'll be meeting on the 12th. Um, if you're comfortable on the 12th with the document, uh, then you'll see the document in December. If you need another meeting, we will meet again uh, the week after Thanksgiving before the December meeting. Uh, the goal is to get the uh, document um, moving 
uh, from Planning Commission into City Council public hearings uh, after the first of the year. Okay, if there's, uh, I'd like to get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Everyone in favor? Aye. Second. Meetings adjourned. Huh? It has to be. They got what they got approved. Yeah. Uh -huh.